I'm Brett Pemberton. I am a staff software engineer, staff software engineer at Slack. Uh, I'm in the Cloud Foundations team, which is an internally focused team, and we provide platforms for other teams at Slack to deploy and run their code at scale. Uh, I'm on the Foundations team, which generally provides uh, the AWS um, sort of bare metal platform. Bare metal is a weird term, but sure. The AWS version of bare metal to other teams uh, using Terraform uh, for the infra and uh, Chef for configuring the VMs. Uh, we also have the Kubernetes platform, which uh, runs on top of our platform. So technically, our platform runs everything at Slack. It just slightly level, different bit of indirection. Um, Lee London is my colleague who also uh, was presenting this talk and was meant to be here to give it with, uh, with me, but a combination of his entire family getting COVID and his football team failing to make the grand final meant that he was not able to attend. So I am here just by myself. And if there's any weirdness in the slides, that is because he still has access to the slide deck. And so that's all Lee, and I thank him for all the work that he did in the talk. So Chef, as I said, is used indirectly in, in charge of every instance that we run at Slack, and we want, run quite a few of them. Uh, it's been that way since before I joined, and uh, probably a long time before. This is just a, a vague idea of what the day looks like and the week, the week looks like for the Chef server. That's just the raw instance count for our primary um, Chef instance. So you can see we do a relatively good job of tracking load in Slack, which generally is lower during the weekends. It's got peaks throughout the day as different regions come online and come offline. And I think you know today I can say we do a pretty good job of scaling dynamically to accommodate that load. Um, you've got some good peaks and troughs there, which is great. It's mostly powered by you know AWS auto scaling at some point, whether it's via a schedule or whether it's actually measuring and detecting load and, and scaling because of that. And like I said, the, the teams using Kubernetes that all uses the same sort of processes under the hood, so it's great. It definitely was not anything like that when I joined Slack. Uh, it would have probably for the week looked a lot more like a flat line. Um, for a start, there was you know, one fifth the number of instances, but aside from that, it was mostly human powered scaling. Uh, engineers looking at graphs, looking at metrics, seeing something that you know, looks like it could use a little bit more oomph, so let's uh, you know, give it some more instances. Sometimes that would have been using auto scaling groups. We were very kind of late to the game on that, but we still had some things in auto scaling groups. But even then, it would have been a human deciding, I'm going to throw some more instance at this, or provisioning by hand and, and doing it that way. But uh, it was what I would say is iterative scaling. Um, so you're just kicking a can down the road. You see, see a problem, you scale to meet it, and you don't have a sort of a, a big event to, to cause you to change the way things are. It's just when you join a company, you look at how it is, and most of the time you, you adapt your way of thinking to meet it the way things are currently done. And so it's very easy to just keep going in that, in that kind of method. Um, so for a developer experience, it was a very uh, interesting way to get changes out to production. So. Chef uh, uses cookbooks. These are all in version control in a repository, as you'd expect. There's pull requests that go to uh, make changes to production or to development. But generally, it was a very kind of lax affair of put up a PR, maybe test it on a dev instance, and uh, get a plus one LGTM from your colleague and merge it in. And that's basically it until uh, when that happened. Uh, Jenkins, our frenemy Jenkins, would see that there is a change and upload that cookbook to Chef, and it would basically just sit there. Um, most instances wouldn't then take any, make any change because of that, until the time known as Chef O'Clock, which was 3 p.m. Pacific, because, uh, you know, American company, everything's in Pacific. At 3 o'clock Pacific, Chef O'Clock happened. And at that time, basically every instance in the fleet woke up and said, well, time to chef. And you can see the kind of load change from the chef service point of view. It was uh, 
you know, through the day, there was some ad hoc stuff. You know, someone might actually be converging to test. If there was an incident, you might be pushing out, uh, you know, an instruction to chef to a portion of the fleet. But for the most part, it was pretty s static. So the entire world just woke up and said, hey, chef, what you got for me? And um, that only works for so long. Uh, and at that point, you know, we started to overwhelm the chef server. It was a single uh, instance, the single backend instance, uh, running chef, the component tree, so there was Postgres, uh, RabbitMQ, Elasticsearch, uh, all of that running on a safe, stateful instance, which you cross your fingers and hope that doesn't go down, uh, with some Nginx hosts in front to do the uh, load balancing, uh, and it really didn't enjoy chef o'clock. But like, the same thing, it, it, sometimes processes just work enough to get by and the, they just stay that way. You iterate on them a little bit, you, you know, bump up instance sizes, you add more front ends, but it really takes a big you know, driving force to, to make that change. So new engineers most of the time would just join, raise their eyebrows and then you know, get on with work and realize that it, it, it mostly works, so I'm gonna get on with my work. But that only got us so far, uh, and at some point, uh, the incidents of Chef being unavailable were too much, so it was time for a uh, re-architecture. The uh, poor Chef backend host um, was terminated. It, it lasted uh, a good two years, and we thank it for its service, but um, we replaced it with some nice native AWS infra. So using managed Elasticsearch for the search cluster, using Aurora for the, back, uh, for the database, uh, NLB, uh, you know, all of the fun stuff. And then you can just have a fleet of uh, Chef EC2 instances that are stateless and you can scale them much easier. And you can also individually scale all of the different component trees to match whatever current problem, whatever bit is on fire. And we, you know, you still did have fires, but they're a lot more manageable, you know. The, the, the search instances are having a bit of a bad time. Let's bump up the instance size. You know? The d database is having some replication lag. Let's bump up the, the instance size. Again, it's sort of iterative scaling that only gets you so far, but eventually we hit a line in the sandwich that we can't scale our way out of, but uh, we're not there yet. So for a developer point of view, it was pretty much the same. And the problem with the workflow is, uh, as a developer, it was really the onus was on you to do all of your testing. And the problem is you needed to know the testing that you needed to do. If you were changing something, you needed to know which instances in dev were running you know, something that you could test it on, whether they even existed in the first place, uh, and you needed to know how many hosts you know, your, your change was gonna go out to. That's a pretty easy mistake to make. With Chef Cookbooks, there's a lot of nested inheritance and things like that that mean that your change sometimes uh, can go to a much wider audience than you thought it was going to go to, and we had uh, quite a few in, in uh, quite a few problems with changes going out to places that they were not expected to go out to and having unforeseen consequences. So uh, again, that's one of the sort of things that push you to make changes. Um, and in this case also, you needed to have chef credentials to do these testing operations. So every engineer needed to have right access to the entire chef uh, server. That's not good for uh, security. There's a Pretty big problem with that, and uh, it's not good for scaling either. You don't want to be constantly managing individual users and and doing all that to be able to scale to add the engineers that are growing during your your period of growth. Uh, and you know we we had periods of growth, so we uh, were constantly growing, constantly adding new features. New features need new technology. That all needs to run somewhere, which means more load on Chef. You replace parts of the stack over time, new services, you know, uh, new teams get hired, uh, new teams are formed, uh, they hire new people. And these people have new opinions on how things should be run. Uh, even something as simple as Chef has many different ways to accomplish the thing that you wanna do. And uh, you have to sort of allow for that in uh, the way that you, you do things. Um, part of that means teams started using Chef for more than just configuring uh, a host. Uh, Chef is a very easy way to store data. 
If you have some data, you need, not customer data, but if you have some metadata for your service or you've got a distributed system and you need some sort of state to bootstrap from, it's really easy and tempting to just store it in, in the chef node object. And uh, we're Australian, we are pretty breezy in our attitude. If uh, teams wanna do that, we sort of just said, go for it, it's fine, she'll be right, mate. And uh, that caused some problems later on. Um, but for the most part, things are fine. Uh, slides love to have negative things on them because there's only so many positive things you can talk about in a, in a slide deck without sounding like an, an ad. So um, Chef, for the most part, it was working fine. It wasn't broken for the most part. It just had some speed bumps and we just sort of evolved over the years to make the most of it. Uh, there were a couple of things we used uh, to help developers be able to use Chef better. And one of those was feature flags, which are exactly as you would expect. Uh, it's sort of a, a, some extra uh, Ruby that we add to uh, the cookbooks to allow you to do things like this. If, you, if your feature is enabled on your host, you do a thing. If the feature is not enabled on the host, you undo the thing so that you can move hosts in and out of the feature flag as you want. You can turn it off and undo your chef code throughout the, the whole fleet, which is very handy in an incident, uh, as long as you write it correctly. Um, and then you've got the feature flag definition. This is a, a really simple example, but there's a lot of other things you can do. You can push it out to you know, a percentage of, the, of a region, a percentage of an AZ to a single OS version. You know, There's so many different matches we have to allow you to really tune where you want your feature to go out to and gives you a lot more flexibility and safety in being able to not push changes uh, to all of production at once, which is not good. Uh, and Zonal Chef is the other way we tried to help out. Um, rather than having all of the world chef all at once, uh, I think everyone can see the problem with that, uh, Zonal Chef allows us to splay that out over the entire uh, working day. Um, so over each six hour period, basically, uh, you get an allocated some slots based on your uh, a availability zone, and then we can stagger those to uh, you know chef out throughout the day, um, so that you're not running uh, on an entire region at once. If you push something bad, theoretically, it'll only go to a, a handful of regions uh, or a handful of AZs, and your monitoring will pick that up, and you'll not roll your feature flag any further, and potentially even roll it back until you fix it. But Things like that really helped us to be able to, you know, enable developers to use Chef safely. However, not always. Um, sometimes there are some things we can't scale your way out of, uh, and sometimes, despite you know feature flags and zonal Chef, sometimes bad changes get merged and manage to uh, cause problems. And sometimes there's problems within Chef itself. Uh, Chef has an idea of cookbook versions and you generally have some cookbook versions. Uh, if you have too many, it's bad. Uh, at one point we had 20,000 and Chef started to fall over and it was, it was a bad time. We fixed that. We had some stuff that would clean up old cookbook versions that didn't do a very good job of cleaning up cookbook versions. And then we cleaned them up by hand and then it happened again a year later, and this time we got to 84,000, which was amazing. I thought that was a great, great uh, shows how well we tuned Chef over that year that we managed to get much, much further along before it started to go on fire. And the best part of that is the Chef documentation is very clear that you should keep it under 500. So we did, we went above and beyond. Good job, us. Now, According to my speaker notes here, there are animated icons appearing on the screen. I don't know if you're seeing the same screen as me, but I suspect Lee's animated icons are not appearing as well as he expected. But uh, nope, that's definitely not animated. But anyway, <laughs> at the scale that we operate, there's uh, just a sheer number of hosts in the fleet, and you know people are going to push changes. And we started seeing problems, uh, cha pushing changes to some systems. Some are fine, some are more risky and brittle, as you'd expect in any you know, software company. And some systems didn't have enough redundancies, but we had a trend of incidents, 
Uh, not every incident at Slack is visible to the external public, so uh, we have a lot of safety that helped us out with that, but even so, it got to the point where we needed to have a feature freeze. Uh, not a feature freeze, a code freeze. It's uh, line in the sand, no more, no more code changes, please. Uh, this has gone too far. We, even all of the safety mechanisms I said were not enough, and we had to just take a step back, and this is one of those points where you do get to take the time and re-architecture things and come up with a better solution than just iteratively changing things. Um, so what we wanted to do is, there's some standard things in software engineering you can do to make your life easier. Um, these seem pretty obvious, but, uh, you know, they're obvious after the fact. So have a standard review process with you know, questions and testing, slightly painful, maybe even more painful. Uh, continuous integration and automated testing. That's something we just weren't doing and it's something we needed to do. And being able to track the progress towards safety and target things that will give us the best bang for buck for safety. And that was uh, what we needed to do. Again, there's there is an animated GIF here of, of something awful, but it, it, we'll, we'll just pretend that that worked. So we uh, did what some other companies do and put in a change, change advisory board process. It is, it is not pleasant for anyone. It's not pleasant for the poor uh, managers sitting there listening to us engineers beg to be able to make a change to production. It's not pleasant for the engineers trying to make a change to production and it's a safe change. Trust me, it's a safe change. It's not gonna break anything. But it's, yeah, it was a very old school sort of big hammer that we had to pull to just give us the time to implement the actual good changes. But we, we are Slack and we did it all in Slack. Uh, interestingly, while researching this topic, we found the old channel that we used to have to go to with our changes in hand and beg for, for permission to apply them. And it had just been wiped completely from our memories. It was a real trip down memory lane to see this, this channel and look back at the times you had to go in there. But yeah, the, uh, you would uh, trigger a workflow asking for a uh, approval to, to release a change. Uh, you could have a low risk change. It's a mono repo, so there was plenty of other stuff in there that you could have exempted from change. It was an awful solution that we only dealt with for a while until we were able to sort of spread the knowledge of what we were trying to accomplish with that and the things that we're looking for in the changes, whether there's been testing, what the risk assessment is, all of those things. We ended up coming with a set of training that people do to become a cab deputy. You get a lovely little badge. And that gives you the power to approve or reject change. And that let us spread that out to the teams making the changes itself. And they don't need to seek out approval from external you know, forces. As long as there's a cab deputy on their team, they can take it on themselves to assess the, assess the change and you know, we were able to drop the paperwork, drop all the submitting to channel, which is why I'd forgotten that channel even existed. Instead, we made some lovely pretty labels in GitHub. And Lee loves this portion of the talk and I'm not gonna do it justice, but you can look at a PR and look at the color labels and it really tells a story. We've got like some soothing blue for the low blast radius. We've got nice calming green for the low risk. We've got a really angry red for the high blast radius stuff and we've got like a scary yellow. You can combine them all, there's some other stuff in there. You can really just get a real sense of what this PR is doing based on the labels in there. Uh, if, it's, if it's failed, there's another even more ghastly color in there. And there's some other things, you know, getting rid of Jenkins gets you a die Jenkins die label for some reason, spicy changes. What we've learned is that you really need to have control over who can create labels in GitHub because we don't have control over that and that's the fun that happens. So, we've got an uplifted process, great. Now, what do we want to do to make this better? Automated testing is the big one. Uh, test Kitchen is a, a great product um, from Chef that lets you test cookbooks and in an automated fashion, amazing. Why weren't we doing this earlier? Who knows, but 
We, uh, it, it is kind of a pain in the ass because it's got a lot of YAML, and a lot, I mean a lot of YAML. So what we did was we wrote a wrapper around it. We have a, a unique naming scheme, but we, we called it Gitchen. Um, I like it because it looks like Glitchen, but um, it, you can call it whatever you want, but it gives you a much smaller set of YAML that you just need to say what your cookbook, you put it in your cookbook directory, tell you what you're testing, set some chef attributes that you want to test, set your recipe and your node and your run list and all of that, and then it'll take over from that. That's part of the fun. Um, we also wanted to do more analytics to make sure that we're moving in the right direction and have some database decision making so that we can pick the best bang for buck, like I said earlier. So Gitchen, yeah, uh, it, it made it a lot easier by taking the barrier to entry for automated testing away and making it a lot easier for the uh, engineers to just define a set of tests and, and have them automatically get executed at CI time or manually if you want to do it by hand. There's a lovely little workflow for this whole thing, but essentially both CI and invoking it by hand it does two uh, concurrent sets of tests where it provisions a standard host from uh, the current master and then converges your changes onto that host. Uh, it also uh, provisions a new chef environment and provisions a host against that environment to test if you've merged this, will new hosts provision? Because that's quite a common problem that you merge a change that works fine on existing hosts, but new hosts coming up, different story, all of a sudden you can't provision uh, alerts firing. So that made the two testing things that you were supposed to do by hand that not every engineer, uh, myself included, really ever followed. But uh, by taking that away, it just, it meant that a lot more testing got done and a lot more bugs got found pre-merge. Um, but that's not really the full story. I mean, all that was doing was testing whether Chef was gonna actually converge and that, that's not, really a good test. You could merge a change that tells Chef to delete uh, some very important file off the file system. And Chef will do that and your tests will say, yes, Chef ran, everything is fine and your file is gone. So it's not good enough to just have that. So we uh, also invested a lot into server spec testing um, to allow us to have some standard unit tests and get those to run. So here's an example of a unit test uh, defined uh, in the Chef cookbooks. You can put it right near your code that actually does the thing. Here's a simple example of, uh, of ATOP. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a configuration file for ATOP. Should exist. Uh, we want to make sure the service is actually enabled in uh, system D. We want to make sure the service is running. And by defining it as an instance test, uh, I can't remember that one. I think that just means uh, it'll, um, every time Chef runs, uh, what it'll do is it'll write out a server spec test that meets that spec, and it'll run that after Chef has run and uh, output a Prometheus metric to say whether or not uh, the test passed or passed failed, test failed. And then you've got some nice dashboards you can make from that. You can see on your fleet whether, you know, how many tests you've got, how, whether they're all passing, whether they're all failing. Uh, it just made life a hell of a lot easier to have that sort of abstracted out and um, not have to do it all yourself. So now that we've got automated testing, we've got uh, unit testing that the automated testing you know, invokes, how do we measure how successful that's been and how far we need to go before we get out of the, the ditch that we'd found ourselves in? Um, so we invented a thing called the Infra Safety Score, and basically it was just testing cookbooks to doing static code analysis of your cookbooks to make sure they have test coverage, those tests are meaningful tests, they're not just, you know, uh, I'm not even going to dignify that. They are meaningful tests of an actual service, not just, uh, you know, bunk, but... Uh, and that all happened automatically. Uh, it uses um, our data warehouse, so it made things a lot easier that there was a score in the, in the warehouse and you could automatically qu query that, come up and uh, aggregate the scores per team, per service, wrap it up in a single number score. Um, oh, my team is not number one for some reason, but that is fine, we'll deal with that later. Um, but yeah, the units don't measure, measure, it's just matter, it's just, you know, everything needs to go up. 
And the other advantage is you could use that to then check what change you could, what cookbook you could target, for instance, to add the automated tests for to really bump that number up. We um, had a number that we needed to hit. And I think there's a moral to this slide too. The, uh, the red line is the, the number we needed to hit by the end of quarter. And not only did we hit it, we then stuck around at that level for a very long time. I, I think there's a lesson in that for all of us and maybe we should adjust that number up a bit more and see if, it, it seems like we don't want to add any tests above and beyond the bare minimum. Um, if I'd thought about it, I would have put in a, a slide about uh, uh, items of flair from office space, but uh, it's very similar. But stonks go up is what I'm meant to be saying here, that uh, management like to see a graph like this where it goes up and reaches the line. And with something like that at your, at your side, you can convince uh, management to, to let you invest in your, in your safety, which is great. Um, the other advantage was chef users, not needed anymore. We had the automation working. Uh, we had, uh, I hate to call him again, but Jenkins. Jenkins, our friend, was there to uh, take away the need for users to actually interact with Chef directly. So that was a big win. No more creating users in Chef, no more worrying about that as a security hole. And that brings us to the modern era. Um, so now that we, then we had all that in place, we reached our safety score, we were sort of more confident in making changes which was very useful because at this time we were running an ancient version of Chef uh, that was about to go EOL, which is never a good thing, and we needed to get the hell off it. And we were previously really scared to make that change. We didn't know what was going to happen, uh, whether it was going to be safe, whether it wasn't. But um, with uh, the service spec tests in place from the service owners, uh, with Gitchen in place, we were able to make it a lot easier to, to test whether everything was going to work. So we created a whole bunch of feature flags for each of the different versions, because you need to go version by version. Um, and we just uh, tested our way through it. And uh, we went from being frightened and, and sticking around on Chef Client 12 uh, to running the most recent release. And we did it without an incident and without any problems at all. It was uh, unreasonably good. Uh, and that also came in handy next OS version release. Uh, users don't like operating system version uh, changes. And with Gitchen, we were able to add in some new CI where it overrode what version of OS uh, the tests run on, which was a configurable item in your YAML file. So uh, any PR that you put up would automatically get tested, not just on the version you're running on, but on the, the version after that. So that wasn't necessarily a blocking test, so you could still quite happily merge a change that isn't going to work in the next version of the OS, but at least you got a lovely little green check on your PR saying that uh, everything's going to be OK. And I love green checks on my PRs. So yeah, that um, made making changes a lot safer. Uh, anytime you make a change, you know, the PR will automatically do all these tests for you pre-merge. Uh, again. I, it, it sounds like an obvious thing, but it was an obvious thing that was missing from our tool belt for a long time. And it took a, a large you know, series of incidents to give us the ability to provide that. And that's something that's missing in, in uh, you know, normal everyday scaling, is that you, you need those big, big boom events to be able to justify putting in some real effort into your uh, testing regime. Um, but yeah, now you'll, you won't be able to merge a change that's going to break things, uh, which is great. No more chef credentials, which is great. But uh, you know, the, like I said, scaling things iteratively will only get you so far. And that's the problem we're hitting with our current chef uh, architecture. You can only scale so far with a, with a single chef cluster. So next on the, uh, on the list, is working to shard hosts out to multiple chef servers. Uh, you can have, have multiple chef servers, hosts split, split among them, uh, Route 53 health checks, taking them in and out of service as they do good and as they do bad, and to no longer be scared that a sh uh, breaking the chef server is going to mean that provisioning is down. Uh, we provision, uh, as you saw in the first slide, we are constantly provisioning hosts, and any outage to Chef means that potentially a team who is trying to scale up to meet demand right now 
can't scale. So we really need some backup redundancy. So yeah, makes sense. Let's let's shard chef. Um, except for that problem um, where we're using chef as a data source. Uh, who knew that was going to come back to bite us? But um, that's the problem with uh, using Chef as a data source is now that you've got multiple Chef shards, how do you query them? Uh, we are needing to talk to all the service owners who, who use Chef as a data source and we're trying to figure out what the best path forward is. You've got to be either shard aware or you've got to use a very badly named uh, fan out search service that we've built to you know, be able to query all the multiple uh, Chef shards all at once. Uh, that's fine for read operations, for write operations. Uh, that's going to be an interesting problem. Um, but yeah, it's going to unlock a, a lot of things for us. Uh, we can have shards for uh, regionally uh, to make the you know, latency much better for, for our remote regions, which are usually quite slow to chef, thanks to uh, chef being in uh, US East 1 and the rest of the world not. Uh, or, you know, um, having a multiple, uh, sorry, having a, a segregated shards for specific services maybe to keep them isolated. It's just a lot of things to unlock and it'll help us scale uh, for the future. So, incremental growth. Yeah, that's, that's what gives you incremental scaling and that's fine for the most part, but occasionally you need a big event to trigger you know, an actual proper re-architecture or you know, a change to your process or something like that. And those changes, unfortunately, most of the time are, are, are the bad changes. Uh, I'd love it to be uh, you know, something more positive, but a lot of the time you, you have to have a, a bad experience to you know, really look at, at your environment and, and come up with a better way of doing things. Uh, these things take time. It, we have been talking about this for nearly 30 minutes, but that took years of, of work and it, it's been a long, long while coming and these things take time and you need to be patient. And for the most time, you know, an acceptable system is good enough for now and you can work with that and you can make it better and get there in the long run. Um, it's, you've got to make the good thing easy to do and making things visible to not just to the developers uh, you know, and the engineers running their code, but also to management and you know, the higher ups who want to be able to see your reliability and your safety as a, as a metric and be able to track that. That's really useful for trying to get the, uh, the work authorized. And um, if you can, don't multiple, you know, don't, don't upload too many cookbooks to Chef. Don't do it again a year later. And I swear we're cleaning that up. It's definitely not going to happen again. Thank you very much. That is uh, everything that I have. But if we've got any questions. Thank you.